All right, we have uh, we've been dealing with a great theme uh, of this vacation Bible school. This this idea of under the big top, and uh, the idea that that when you come to God's Word, there are a lot of great stories uh, that we read about. And when you when you read uh, here's the four lessons the the four lessons that are a part of this. When you read the stories about Samson uh, and Daniel and Jonah uh, that we've already studied uh, as a part of this series. You know, you're talking about some of the great stories in the Bible. Well, if it wasn't enough to deal with Samson uh, in four chapters and Daniel in, in just one chapter of chapter 6 and then Jonah in four chapters tonight, we're going to talk about the life of Jesus uh, in, uh, in four books of the Bible, right? How, how are we going to accomplish that in, uh, in 45 minutes? Well, it's going to be kind of tough. But here's what I want you to do. Can you... Can you get your imagination flowing tonight? I know, I know you're tired, you've had a long day, you're thinking, I don't want to get my imagination out. Too bad. We're at Vacation Bible School, okay? So I want you to get your imagination. To, it's the, the imagination thing, here, here's in case you forgot what it is. The imagination thing, uh, for you ladies, maybe it was the, when you imagined how you would wave when you became Miss America. You know, exactly what would that wave be? You, you're imagining, you know what we're talking about, right? When, when you imagined, when you imagined your, your wedding day and what it would look like, uh, and, and, and you, you had that, and so you know what I'm talking about. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you went out there, I know you did, you went out there in your driveway playing basketball, and, and, and you were there thinking, okay, we're down by one. This is, for, this is for the championship. And you called, you, you didn't call yourself by name. You called yourself something like Magic, you know, and, or, or you called yourself something like Bird. And you said, all right, it, we're down and it's three seconds. We're down, by, we're down by one and I take the shot. Imagination, right? You know how that thing works. So I want you to imagine tonight that the book of John in the Bible was written to you. I want you to imagine that. Guess where we're going. Guess what we're going to study tonight. Okay, you can flip over there. I want you to imagine that the book of John was written to you. I want you to imagine that you are in the first century. And here's the book of John, one of the last letters, uh, one of the last pieces of the New Testament, New Testament to be written uh, near the end of the first century. Um, the writings of John were among those last books that were written uh, of the New Testament. But here's one of the last ones written. I want you to imagine it's written to you. And I want you to imagine, you can, you can, you can choose. I want you to imagine that you're either a new convert to Christ. You've just become a Christian. You've heard about Jesus. You know, Jesus died uh, 50 to 60 years earlier, so you probably never saw him, but you've heard about him. And you've heard preachers tell you about him. And now you've received this letter from Jesus' closest friend. Remember, remember what, how he's referred to in the book of John? The disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the book we're going to look at tonight. And that's the disciple whom Jesus loved just wrote you about Jesus. And so imagine you're either a new convert and you are receiving this letter to tell you who Jesus is, or you can imagine that you're, you, you're, not, you're not sure about Jesus. You, you have not yet quite accepted Him to be who the world's, uh, that, that Christians are claiming Him to be. Perhaps you've heard of Him, but you're not really sure about Him. I want you to imagine you're one of those two, and either your faith isn't there yet, or your faith is brand new. And your faith is so brand new, maybe you're still kind of questioning and feeling things out. And you get this letter from John telling you about Jesus. The book of John is the greatest faith-building book in the Bible. It's the greatest faith-building book in the Bible. That's why it was written. It was written so that when people picked it up and read it, they would walk away from that without any doubt in their mind who Jesus was. 
they would walk away from that believing with all of their heart that Jesus truly is the Son of God because what John does in this is he lays out the evidence and he wants his readers to be confronted with the evidence and to be so confronted with the evidence that you've got to make a choice. Here is, here is, the, here is an, abundant of ev- an abundance of evidence. You've got to make a choice. You can't remain neutral. You either decide, I'm going to believe it, or you decide, I'm not going to believe it, but you can't be neutral anymore. You've got to make a choice. An abundance, and, and the evidence is just, is just overwhelming in this book. But what I want to do tonight, it's interesting what John does. John selects seven signs of Jesus. Now, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, depending on how you count them up, we have recorded about 35 to 40, closer, closer to the higher end of that, we have about 40 specific miracles recorded, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus did. John selects seven. Is seven sort of a Bible number? Just a little bit. Uh, a, a couple of months ago, we studied the I am statements in the book of John. You know how many of those there are in the book of John? There's seven of those. Too. I mean, it's interesting how seven comes into play throughout the Bible and even here in the book of John. But I want, I want us to, as, we, as much time as we can do this tonight, he gives us seven signs of Jesus. Some of these are ones that only John, in fact, five of the seven, John's the only one who tells us about them. And so you can't read about five of these and the other guys, you've got to get them from John. In fact, about 91 or 92 percent of everything John gives us is not in the other gospel accounts. It is unique to him. But he selects seven of them. And, and it's almost as if he is, it's, it's not written in a, in, a, in, a, in a courtroom kind of sense, but it's almost as if he's presenting Exhibit A, Exhibit B. Exhibit C, it's almost as if he's just laying them out there and at the end to say, now what are you going to do? (laughs) Now what judgment are you going to make? You've got all of this evidence to show who Jesus is. Now what are you going to do about it? Now, John doesn't use the word miracle. I don't know if that's significant, but he doesn't use the word miracle in this book. What's a miracle? Don't say if the Dolphins win the Super Bowl. What's, 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 what's a miracle? Okay, it, 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 it is a supernatural act that shows that, that, that is an evidence of the power of God. A miracle is, is not natural, it is supernatural. But John doesn't, he records miracles, but he doesn't use that word. He doesn't in this book use the word wonders. That's that's another Bible word that's often used, but John doesn't use that word. The Bible calls miracles wonders because that's what it was supposed to create. That was supposed to uh, that's what it was supposed to uh, uh, to stimulate in people was was wonder and awe and astonishment, and that's there. But he doesn't use that word. He specifically uses the word signs seventeen times in the book. Doesn't say miracles. Doesn't say wonders. Doesn't say mighty works. Some of the other things that. You'll have another place. But he uses the word signs. Why? Why the word signs? What, is, what does that word indicate? It signifies something, Betty says. The word, word signs is a word that indicates here is proof. Here is the evidence. Here is the, the signification, the significant things. Here is the proof that Jesus really is the Son of God, and he calls them signs. Why? Because the world had been waiting for signs. How do you know who Jesus is? Oh, there's going to be these signs that come. And so John says, here are the seven signs. And as Jesus, as Jesus goes through the course of doing these miraculous acts, you see divine pity for mankind. Did, did Jesus do anything for himself? Were, were, these, were, were these signs and miracles, were they for himself? No. Well, here, I've been, I've been fasting for 40 days. I'm going to make myself a meal. And Satan, he's so small-minded, he just wants me to make bread. Forget that. I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a five-course meal. Who, who wants bread after 40 days? I, I want everything the world has to offer. Did he do that? Nothing for himself. 
His, his acts were done to show love and compassion for man. So you see his divine pity, you see his divine power, and you see that everything that's happening here is, is for divine purpose. So go to the book of John, go to chapter 1, and I, I, again, I want, you to put your, I want you to put your imagination, I want you to get your imagination working here, okay? This was written to you, and you pick it up. This is a document written that is the, that, how did I describe it? As, as the book, the most faith-building book in all of the Bible. And here's how he starts. In the beginning was the Word. And you're already tr trying to figure out what in the world's that. Who is that? And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Well, that's intriguing. Maybe you never read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Maybe this is the first document you've read. And you just heard about the Word who was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. If all things were made through Him, who made me? He made me. So this Word, who is God and was, and, and was with God, He made me. Um, and uh, verse 4, in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was another man, a different man, sent from God, whose name was John. That's not the word, but here's another man. This man, verse 7, came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might do what? John talked about Jesus. Why? So that everybody would believe in Jesus. The key word in this book of John is the word believe. You're going to find it a hundred times. 21 chapters, you're going to find the word believe or some form of that 100 times in the book. What's the purpose of this book? Most faith-building book in all of the Bible. Here to help us believe. Drop down to verse 14. Who is this word all about? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is this? This is Jesus. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How did they behold Jesus' glory? Was it that halo that He was wearing? You've seen the pictures, right? I mean, He got, had that halo every morning. He woke up and put a good shine on it, uh, get, get it looking really good. How did, how did they behold His glory? Did, did he have a natural glow? You, you've heard about people having a natural glow, right? Uh, it, did, did, he, did he have one of those? He, he was just beaming all of the time. No. Isaiah said there's nothing about him that makes him stand out physically. Nothing about them that makes us say, hey, look, look, it's Jesus over there. That's the only person. No, there's nothing about him physically that would draw your attention to him. So what does he mean that we beheld his glory? By the things that he did. Here at the very beginning of this, John is drawing you in to say, hey, you know what we saw? We saw His glory. Here's an eyewitness saying, we saw His glory. John, verse 15, he bore witness of Jesus. And so we, we, had, a, we had a witness right there with Him, but we saw it too. Verse 16, of His fullness we have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. I want you to think about that statement. No one has seen God at any time. But what did the first verses say? He was with God. He was God. He became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has seen God the Father in heaven at any time. But guess who we saw? No one has seen the God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared Him. It's not talking about Jesus saying things. That, that's involved. It involves in preaching. But Jesus declared God, meaning Jesus showed us God. Put your imagination on. You just received a letter that says, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm going to tell you about Jesus who we saw His glory. I'm going to tell you about Jesus who showed us who God was. And so you start reading through this book and seven signs that John has handpicked for you to read. Look in chapter 2. We, we, won't, we obviously don't have time 
to, to just uh, dig into all of these. We'll look, at a, we'll look at a couple of them maybe more in depth than the others. But you, you get early on in this letter that, some, that John, the good friend of Jesus, wrote to you. You get to this in chapter 2. And he says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of oinos, wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? That's not a, the, in, in our world, that would be a snarky, uh, rude comment. Uh, in that world, it was not. Uh, he says, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, here's a great line, whatever he says to you, do it. There were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews that were there, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Six times 20, 120 to 180 gallons in those six vessels could be, could be stored. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, 120 to 180 gallons, and they filled them up to the rim with brim. You remember that commercial? They filled them up to the brim. What does that mean? Can you get anything else in there? If they're filled up to the rim with brim, if they're filled up to the brim, did Jesus kind of pour his Kool-Aid powder on top there and, and just give it a little swirl? And uh, is, is that what happens here? No, nothing else is going in here. He said to them, draw some out now. What did they put in the water pots in verse 7? Good old H2O. He said, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. And did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. Said to him, every man, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the, the guests are, are well drunk in the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus goes to this wedding feast. Jesus says to his mother, it's not really time for me yet. But as good mothers do, yes, son, I know. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Fill them up. And some, somewhere between the taking of that water out of one of those pots and somewhere between that and getting it to the master of the feast, it changes. How did it do that? There's no other explanation. Did those guys know what they had filled the water up with or filled the pots up with? And somewhere between, they, they, they get their, uh, what did they take it out with? They, they, did they use a ladle? Did they use, uh, what, what do you use? Did they use a cup? Um, what what'd they put in there? They put something in there. Do you think they saw it change? Uh, do you think they got it to the master of the feast and he takes a sip and he just gets all excited and they think, well, it's just water. Uh, what, somewhere that changed. Now look in verse 11. You, you just received this. You just read about Jesus doing this. And in verse 11 it says, this beginning of, this beginning of signs. What, is, what does that imply? Beginning of signs. Oh, there's, I'm just getting you started. I, we're, we're just getting revved up here. This beginning of signs Jesus did, don't forget this, in Cana of Galilee and what? manifested His glory. That's what we read in chapter 1. We have seen His glory. How have we seen the glory of Jesus? By the miracles that He did. By the signs that He did. And what, did, what was the response of His disciples at the end of the verse? Why did Jesus do these things? He did them. Not, he did them so that people would believe in Him. And after that, He went down to Capernaum. He and His mother and His brothers and His disciples and they didn't stay there many days. So I want you to remember, here's Cana, here's Capernaum. Jesus goes to Cana of Galilee. He does his first miracle there. Now, as we keep reading, come down to chapter, stay in chapter 2. Come down to verse 23. And remember, you're just reading through this. You just read the, the first miracle. And he says, this is just the beginning. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover. Now, where was he at the beginning of the chapter? He's in Cana of Galilee. He's up north. 
But now in verse 23, he's in Jerusalem down south at the Passover during the feast. And while he was there, many believed in his name. Well, why did they do that? When they saw the signs which he did. John doesn't say there were only seven signs that he did. He just sprinkles these other statements in along the way. He did this beginning of signs, but you know what? He was doing other ones too, all along the way. And what was that doing? It was causing people to believe in him. Chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. And what did he say to him? Rabbi, we think that you're from God. Oh, your Bible doesn't say think? We, 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 we've, we have voted on this, and we voted that you must be from God. No, 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 no. We know that you are a teacher from God. Well, how do you know that? For, here's the reason, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You're reading along here, and you read about a guy that just comes to Jesus by night, and, and you, he says, We've been hearing, we've been seeing these signs, and you know what we know? Here's what we know. There's only one explanation. You're from God. Uh, there, there's no other way to explain. And would this, would this be building faith within you? You're reading this. You're hearing this. Wow. Jesus did more, not just that one. Jesus has done more signs than that. Come down to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, in verse 46, we're going to see another uh, the, the second of John's seven signs. But before we read that, I want you to read, uh, let's start in verse 43. Now, after the two days, he departed from there and he went to Galilee. Where's Galilee? He's going back up north. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. He was not accepted in Jerusalem nearly as well as he was up in Galilee. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. Now, why did they receive him so much, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast? So here they are. They had gone down to the feast. They saw what he did and say, wow, there's no other explanation. This guy is from God. So look at verse 46. Here's the second sign. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee. And in case you had forgotten, what does John remind you? That's where he did the first miracle. Don't forget he, you, you are receiving this, and he tells you about the first sign, and then he tells you about the second one, but he's going to say, now don't forget about that first one. He, he's just building. He's just, he, he is just building one upon the other. He came to Cana of Galilee, where Jesus made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when we read this, we think, okay, uh, where's that? Well, you get, you get your Bible you get your Bible map out, and you look at, you look at Galilee uh, on your Bible map, and, and Cana is, is due, uh, what's that direction? West. Cana is due, well, for you, that's that way. Cana is due west from the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is right up on the northern edge, right up on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, 16 miles away from Cana. Jesus is in Cana. A man from Capernaum has come over to Cana because he heard Jesus was there. Now, some of you drive 16 miles to get here. Some of you drive more than that. Some of you drive 16 miles to get here. I won't ask you how long it takes you to get here. Um, that wouldn't be a fair question um, because, you know, then we'd have to talk about, are we talking Sundays, Wednesdays? Am I running late or am I running early? You know, you know, what, so... Um, no, I didn't say the word speed, Jackie. Don't, in, don't infer anything into what I'm saying now. So 16 miles in that day, though, not so easy. 16 miles in that day would have taken them nearly a whole day travel. Uh, at least a half a day, but probably two-thirds to three-quarters of a day of travel. But he went there uh, to Capernaum. When he heard that, G or he went to Cana. Verse 47, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Galilee, or out of Judah into Galilee, he went to him over in Cana. Now, why did he go there? Implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. 
if your son was dying, would you leave him? If your son, your child, was at the point of death, they were about ready to take their last breath at any moment, could you walk away from them? Could you travel to a place that's going to require you to be gone at least two days? You can't get there and get back in the same day. Could you leave your son? Could you leave your child? This man does. What would compel him to do that? Well, he's got a pretty good reason, right? He implored Jesus to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He's desperate. He's begging him. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. Jesus, you didn't even bother to go and look at him. How do you know his son lives? You're 16 miles away. What, what's, uh, what's 16 miles from here? Jeff, is your house 16 miles from here? Up in Tequesta? Pretty close. What's Wellington? 16 miles? Um, Jesus, you didn't even go check him out. Go your way. Your son lives. So the man, what's the next word? Believed. Excuse me? <laughs> I just met you. You just met me. In essence, you said, he didn't say this, but he could have misunderstood it and said, in essence, you just told me, go away. But this man hears Jesus' words and he believes the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Let me ask you something. If you had left your child at the point of death to go on at least a two-day journey, could you have left Cana without Jesus? Would you have wrapped him up? Would you have thrown a pillowcase over his head? I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what you're thinking, but could you walk away from him? What in the world would cause you to walk away from him? Faith. He absolutely believed what Jesus said. So he went his way, verse 51. This is cool. As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. That's what Jesus told him. And so he wants, he, he, he's, he's, he puts his CSI cap on and he's, he's trying to figure out, okay, I got, I, got, I got to know. I just, I got to figure this out. So he inquired of them the hour. No, okay, he, he, he lives. He got better. Tell me, what time was that? Tell me what hour he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. We won't talk about whether it's Jewish or Roman time. Yesterday, remember, it's a two-day journey. So he is now on his second day coming back. Traveled to Jesus, probably traveled to Jesus, saw him that afternoon, that evening. Jesus says, your son lives, go your way. Either stayed there that night or stayed somewhere else. And now it's the second day he's traveling back, meets, and his, and his servants say, it was yesterday at the seventh hour that the fever left him. And the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. You think he looked at his watch? Uh, would you have looked at your watch? Um, maybe he looked at his watch and said, okay, can I get back in? Nope, can't get back in time. I have to stay. But whatever it was, he knew exactly what time Jesus said that, and now he pinpoints it. And so what does it say at the end of verse uh, 53? He himself believed, and not just him, his whole household. Why did Jesus do these signs? So that people would believe. You just received this letter. Jesus turned water into wine. That's pretty cool. Jesus just healed a boy. 16 miles away. 
He, he didn't even go there. He is not limited by space. He's not limited by distance. He has power over distance and space. He heals him. And this father hears about it and believes, what, what would you do? You just read that. Oh, I don't know about that. If you're still skeptical, what's John going to do? Oh, he's just going to keep piling it on. But I like the last verse because John's counting them for you. The last verse. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea of Galilee. In other words, I'm going to tell you a number of these and I want you to count them with me. He's not going to count all of them. but He said, I want you to count them with me. And when we get to, to the end of this, you got to make a decision. You believe in him or not. So, you got your imagination flowing? You got this. You're hearing all this. We don't have time to read all of these, but in chapter 5, what happens in chapter 5? You got a chapter heading? Healing of the, of the man, the lame man at the pool uh, of Beth, uh, Beth, uh, Bethesda. Look down in verse 5. Now a certain man there had an infirmity, how long? 38 years. If you had been lame for 38 years, or you heard about somebody who was lame for 38 years, you pretty much just figuring, yep, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm in this for the rest of my life. No hope for me. What happened to this man? Jesus says in verse 8, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And here's a key word when it comes to Jesus' signs in verse 9. What's the second word, if you've got a Bible like mine, what's the second word you've got in verse 9? How soon did he get better? Take two pills and call me in the morning. Is that it? When you read the signs of Jesus, when you read about the divine power of Jesus, his, his miracles were instantaneous. The effect is immediate. And it's obvious. These so-called Modern day healers who, who have people come up who, who are suffering with a headache or suffering with, with, some, with something that nobody can see and all of a sudden they're made better. I, well, how do I know that they were made better? Somebody reports, how do I know? But it, do you think anybody else knew that this guy had been lame for 38 years? Everybody knew this guy. I mean, everybody knows that. It's, and all of a sudden, immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. But here's the key at the end of verse 9. That day was the Sabbath. Who's, who's Lord of the Sabbath? Oh, that's Jesus. They weren't very happy uh, about what Jesus did on the Sabbath day. But he, he, did, he, he did this miracle in order to prove to them who he was. Now, you keep reading in this chapter. And you're going, to, you're going to continue reading additional comments about what Jesus was doing. Look in verse 20. Um, let me find where verse 20 starts. The Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself does, and He will show Him greater works than these. You're reading this. I want you to, I want you to imagine you just got this. I've read about Jesus turning water to wine, healing a boy 16 miles away, healing a guy that had had an infirmity for 38 years, and now Jesus says, Father's going to show you stuff even better than that. What? What can be better? Than, are you kidding me? You're reading this, and it's like you're watching a movie that's just getting better and better. It's building up to a climax. And you're, what do you mean you're going to get better than that? Look down in verse 36. I have a greater witness than John's. John, witness, John bears witness to me, but I got something even better than that. For the works which the Father has given me to finish... The works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. The things that I am doing, the signs that I am doing are proving who I am, that I am the Son of God. Go to chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. And notice what's happening in verse 2. A great multitude followed him. Why in the world would a great multitude be following Jesus? We don't have to guess, right? Because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Jesus, in his miracles, shows power over disease. He shows his power over illness. 
and these people are following him. Perhaps, and no doubt, some of them following just for the experience, but many of them are following him because who else can he be but from God? Now, what, what happens here in the beginning of chapter 6? What chapter or paragraph heading do you have that says what's going to happen here? Feeding of the 5,000. This is the one miracle of Jesus that's found in all four gospel accounts. Why do you think God would record this four times? I mean, if he, if he records it once, isn't that good enough? He, this, is the, this is the one. He records this four times. You think it's impressive? You imagine reading this. You imagine reading about five loaves and two fish. And you know, because you, 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 are, you, are, uh, you are in that, uh, in that culture, you know that when it talks about 5,000 men, you automatically know, oh, that's not even, that's not all of them. Uh, because there'd be women and children there. And you know that there's a multitude there of at least 10,000 people. And you think five loaves and two fish. This is going to be embarrassing. This is going to be sad. And what does Jesus do with those? He feeds, he feeds 10,000 plus individuals, no doubt. And then what happened at the end of feeding them? You know, what's, you know what? It's cool to feed all of them. But then what? Leftovers. Did you all, did you all bring your Tupperware? Anybody want to take some of this and go home? Twelve baskets. What? Twelve baskets what? Full. Of leftovers. What is just that thought? What, what does that tell you about Jesus? Sufficiently fed them. It says they, they ate till they were full. What does it tell you about Jesus? Is, does, he just, is, is he, is, does he just do the bare minimum? Let's see. How many people? Are, you think Jesus could do math? You think Jesus, do you think Jesus knew how much they would eat? I mean, chapter 2, the last two verses of chapter 2 said he didn't need anybody to tell him about who they were. He knew everything about them. You think he knew that there was some lady there that was eating for two and that she might eat a little bit more than some other lady? I mean, do you, think, do you think Jesus was being wasteful? You never thought about that, did you? Do, you? do you think Jesus was being wasteful? What's the point? Jesus supplies us over and above this is the book of John where Jesus says the thief comes to steal and to destroy. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Didn't that, isn't that what we see in chapter 6? I didn't just come to feed you. I came to give, you, to give you more than you need. Is that the way God's grace works too? I mean, we're not talking about physical things now. What about the grace of God? Is it sufficient to save us? If... If, if my sins, I don't have two hands because I'm holding, if, if my sins come up to a certain level, does God's grace just, just barely reach up there? Whew, okay, at least they got covered. Is that the way God's grace works? Just barely gets there. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 12, or maybe it's verse 13 or 14, that His grace was exceedingly abundant toward me. What does that mean? It was gushing over. More than I ever needed. And that's the same passage where Paul says, and I'm the chief of sinners. So if the chief of sinners had grace just bubbling over from God, what does that say to us? He supplies us in abundance. So you read that one of the most captivating stories about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Look at verse 14. Then, these men, then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, what was their reaction? This is truly the prophet who is coming to the world. If you were reading this for the first time, what would you say? Yeah. Amen to that. This is the guy we've been waiting for. He's the one. Now, if you thought feeding 5,000 was great, what's the next thing that Jesus does? You got a paragraph heading? He walks on the water. If there's one miracle you could see, which one would it be? Would you want to see that one? Well, you, it's hard to pick one, right? I mean, you, you've, we, we, we've, how many signs have we seen already? Three, four, we're on number five now. It, just in this book, which one would you want to see? Here's one that, he's not, he's, not walking, he's not walking on calm water. He's walking in the midst of a storm where 
these fishermen who were accustomed to being on the sea are scared little girls by what's going on by this storm. This is a major storm. Sorry. This is a major storm. He's not walking on calm water in, 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 in perfect circumstances. He's walking on choppy water in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the night, somewhere between, uh, between 4 and 6 a.m., between 3 and 6 a.m., he's coming walking to them on the water, pitch black out. This would be pretty cool to see. If you got this letter and you read about Jesus walking on the water, in fact, this, is, this one miracle is found three times in three of the gospel accounts. Would, would you have just said, okay, I got it. There's no question who he is. And, but, but, but John is not going to slow down. He's not going to stop. Uh, he talks about Jesus walking on the water. He t- and, and oh Man, I wish we had time to do more. Go to chapter 9. Just t- tell me what you see in chapter 9. What's the miracle in chapter 9? This is, for John, this is sign number 6. If you're counting them, John chapter 9 is sign number 6 for John. Healing the blind man. How long had this guy been blind? Just a couple days? I mean, he, he did the unthinkable. He looked into the sun and went blind, right? That's what your mom told you? Don't look in the sun, you'll go blind. Nope, he didn't do that. It was worse than that. He got too close to the television. He got so close to the television, he went blind. And, and, and for a couple days, he couldn't see. Is, is, that, is that the deal? Born that way. This man had never seen in his whole life. Jesus comes along. It's such a cool story because because of the reaction of the unbelievers. And yet Jesus comes and heals this man and gives him sight for the first time in his life. Then you go to chapter 11. We're hastening through. If it's like you're 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 just he's just getting better and better and better. Not to minimize in any way turning water to wine, but you read that and you think, that could have been a trick. He could have put something in the bottom of those barrels when they weren't looking. Your mind just thinks because you're you're trained to be a skeptic sometimes. I I just don't know about that one. Healing that boy 16 miles away. Ooh, how did he do that one? I mean, even Houdini couldn't get 16 miles away and back without somebody noticing. How did he do that one? I I can't get it. Healing that lame man, 38. Oh, wow. We all knew he was lame for 30. There wasn't any question. He gets up. How did he make that guy walk? Feeding 5,000. How many witnesses were there to the feeding of the 5,000? You do the math, right? I mean, that's not hard to figure out. How many witnesses were there to this miracle? They knew how much he started with. He knew how much they took up at the end. There's no explanation. I don't care how many cards you can fit up your sleeve. You can't fit that many loaves and fishes up your sleeve. There's no other explanation. And then walking on the water. And then healing, giving sight to a man that was born blind. He had never seen anything, and now he sees. And when these guys come and question him, he just keeps saying, Guys, you're missing the big picture here. This guy mate gave me sight. You're missing this. I'm still not sure. Okay, chapter 11. We read about Jesus raising Jairus' daughter in other gospel accounts. We read about him raising the son of the widow of Nain in other gospel accounts. Here's the only time that we read about him raising Lazarus. How is this one different? Not, again, uh, not trying to minimize anything, but how is this one different than Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son? He's dead four days. Other, the other two dead less than 24 hours, much less than 24 hours, but we'll just cap it at 24 hours. They, they buried their dead the same day. Widow of Nain's on her way out to bury her son. They buried their, their dead the same day. So they're dead less than 24 hours. Here's Lazarus, four days. He's so dead, they've already buried him. It's not the same day. He's so dead, they know what it's going to be if they open up that tomb. No, Lord, please no. You know, that's, he's going to stink. Is there any question? 
When somebody's dead four days, there's no question. And they open that tomb, and Jesus just says, Lazarus, come forth. And this man comes walking out. What do you say? What can you say? I believe. Absolutely. There's no other response for me. I absolutely believe. And you know the reaction of his enemies. They had been trying to find a way to kill Jesus. Now what are they doing? Trying to find a way to kill Lazarus. We still want Jesus dead, but we got to kill the... Why do, why do they want to kill Lazarus? Evidence. They wanted to get rid of the evidence. Why? Because it was just too overwhelming. This guy dead four days and now he's alive again. There is no explanation, but he is the Son of God. Last passage, go to chapter 20. Last two verses of chapter 20. Here's the point. Here's what we've been leading up to. Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Truly, what a great word. And truly, Jesus did. How many has he told us about? Well, he told us about seven specific ones, and then he sprinkled some other ones in, and I skipped a lot of them. He sprinkled some other ones in about he did these signs here and signs over there in general, but seven specific ones. Truly, Jesus did many other signs. Hold on a second. Go to the last verse of the book, just really quick. You got to do this quick. Quicker you do it, quicker we'll be done. Last verse of the book, chapter 21, verse 25. How many did he do? There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So you come back to chapter 20, verse 30, and when John says there are many other signs, how many are you talking about, John? Two or three? Four or five? Six or seven? We can't count them. There's too many to even, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. Is he doing these in secret? Is he doing these behind closed doors? No. He's doing this with eyewitnesses galore. Many are written that are not, many were done that were not written in this book. But these seven and others, these are written, why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And why in the world do you need to believe? So that you may have life in his name. Imagine you got this book from John and you read about these seven signs of Jesus just building up in climax to another climax. Well, it can't get any better than that. And then you get to another climax and you get all of this. And what could you possibly do but believe? Why does God want us to believe? So that we might have life. It's in this book that I just received as a new convert or that I just received as somebody who's searching. It's in this book where it says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever does what? Believe. Believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What an incredible book. The most faith, in my opinion, the most faith-building book in all of the Bible. If you ever have opportunity to talk to somebody and they say the Bible's so big I haven't read it before the Bible's so big where should I start I tell people start with the book of John you can start in Genesis and read it through but I tell people if you don't read any other book read John but if you'll read two read John and Acts back to back Who's Jesus? Jesus.